Good morning, and thank you folks for tuning in on this. We wanna share with you today some input about one of the most critical areas in Hawaii, not only in COVID, but on out for the future, and that's housing, affordable, adequate housing for the people. We have Kali Watson, Kevin Carney, Craig Watase, three of the leaders in this area, progressive, innovative people. They're building this with dedication, with understanding, with respect for people and communities and culture. Kali, a little bit of background on who you are, what you do. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Kali Watson. I'm the president and CEO for Hawaiian Community Development Board. We're a nonprofit uh, housing developer. We've been around about 20 years. We kind of focus in on the Hawaiian communities, but we've done a bunch offsite and uh, we're excited to be a part of this forum. Fantastic. Craig? Craig Watase, I'm the president of Mark Development, uh, a second generation developer. Uh, my family's been involved in affordable housing for since 1977. Uh, we've had the pleasure of developing a lot of projects for Hawaiian homelands, including the former chair of Hawaiian Homes, Kelly Watson, which he didn't bother to mention there. Um, we've built about uh, over 2,000 affordable units in the state of Hawaii. Kevin? Uh, good morning. Uh, Kevin Carney, I'm vice president of EAH Housing. Uh, EAH stands for Ecumenical Association for Housing. Uh, we're a 52-year-old nonprofit. We operate in California and in Hawaii. And in our portfolio, we, we have a little over 10,000 affordable rental units, primarily serving those at 60% and below of the area median income. Okay. Gentlemen, housing is certainly one of the most critical life element areas in Hawaii and one of the most problematic. We have homelessness extensive. We have Hawaiian homelands wait lists that are offensively long. We have many, many, many people who can't, not only can't buy homes, can't find adequate homes to rent or be able to manage to stay in them, especially after the COVID economic impacts. If you folks could envision dealing with all of that. Where do we go from here? What might that look like in your vision? How do we get there and what's in the way of that? You wanna get us started, Kevin? Uh, sure, I mean, it, uh, for what we do, and again, you know, we are primarily uh, low-income housing tax credit developers. Uh, what that means is we use the low-income housing tax credit program which provides uh, basically free equity for our properties uh, to get us started. And uh, it's a public-private partnership in effect, um, but it's very expensive and it has gotten more expensive over the years. We build conventional multifamily housing, basically. Um, and if we had our druthers, there would be more land available to do what we do. Uh, and more funding. We know how to fund it, but there's just not a lot of funding available because it takes a great deal of subsidy to keep the rents low to serve that AMI level. Uh, our properties serve levels all the way down to 30% of the AMI. Below that, you're, you're looking at public housing. Uh, so the bottom line is available land, infrastructure, and funding. So if you could get a sample land area that might be available, how do you get the community, government, and private support on board with that, especially now? Is that addressed to me or one of our other? Wide open. Kali, Craig, jump in. Well, I, I think that, uh... First of all, you know, your comment about the uh, uh, homeless as well as the long waiting list on, uh, for DHHL, I mean, both conditions are prevalent among the Hawaiian community, the homeless, about a third of them are Hawaiian. So our, our nonprofit was developed uh, or created about 20 years ago with that uh, objective of trying to address the lack of housing for Native Hawaiians. And with respect to educating the existing leaders, 
you can look to the past. I, you know, I got to point to Craig's group uh, in their development of the whole Lima Lima project, which was a rent to own process or approach that uses the low income housing tax credits. Home ownership, that's a big thing. So by doing this approach, not only do you have to, you can address the, those that no longer can qualify for mortgages because of this COVID situation. You know, maybe half the households in Hawaii, at least one member of the household has lost their job. So to qualify for a mortgage, that, that's out of the question. So the alternative, which I think we would be able to provide is to use a light tech approach where, you know, the, the homeowner or the person would be, or the household would be renters for 15 years at the end of the 15 year period, convert and they become homeowners. But I, I'll let uh, uh, Craig kind of address that, but it is a matter of educating our existing leaders to this potentially very valuable and practical approach. Yeah, and, and Cully uh, fails to mention that we, we were able to do that demonstration project when he was the chair of Hawaiian Homelands. He gave me land uh, and we had to actually go to go get permission from the United States attorney that said it is okay to use federal low-income housing tax credits on Hawaiian homelands and only rent to Native Hawaiians, which sounds like uh, discrimination based on race, but they, uh, but we were able to demonstrate that it, that they were political class and, and uh, we were able to do that, get tax credits on Hawaiian homelands uh, which added thirteen million dollars of equity on a, or uh, excuse me, about nine million dollars in equity on a ten million dollars of equity on a thirteen million dollar project. So, when we converted to sale, the renters who had been there for anywhere from you know three or four years to fifteen years were able to buy their homes, and it's stipulated by the Internal Revenue Code that we can only sell it for remaining debt. So there, we split up the three and a half million dollars, three million dollars among uh, um, seventy families, and it came out to like sixty, seventy thousand dollars a home for three and four bedroom homes. Meanwhile, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands was developing and selling homes for two hundred fifty, two hundred ninety thousand dollars of of similar size and quality. So, you know, you could see that that uh, they had affordable rentals for 15 years and we had 15 years to train them on how to become homeowners, did, did financial education, homeownership education, and, and it was a great project. But uh, until just last year, you know, nobody, nobody wanted to duplicate it. Nobody wanted to copy it. You know, I, I'm sure if Cully had remained as chair for, you know, we'd, we'd have five or six, seven projects like that. Um, because Hawaiian Homelands gives us free land and free infrastructure uh, as a developer, you know, so. The, Craig, let me jump in on that point too, though. Uh, you know, Craig and I, we partnered up, we went in on the Bola drone to uh, put in a proposal. Uh, we were looking at doing over 200 units. And one of the things that the department, which is, I, I don't understand why, uh, restricted it to purely rentals. We went in with our proposal and, and suggest, hey, let's do the rentals, but let's also do and add the option of them turning into owners, a rent to own scenario, like how Craig did in the whole Lima, Lima project. We got penalized for even suggesting that. And to me, there's a lack of understanding of the benefit because at the end of the day, as a renter, the homesteader has nothing. He walks away, the family receives nothing. Whereas for, as to a rent to own scenario, that family would inherit, not only should that person pass away, but more importantly, it creates equity, like how uh, Craig did in the whole Lima Lima project that is passed on to the family. So there's accumulation of value that is created by using this approach, which I don't understand why the department didn't uh, adopt that and use that more. Yeah, no, and that's a really important point, I think, Craig and Kali, because culturally, this is primarily an Asia Pacific constituency here. Culturally, the connection to the Aina, whether it's Hawaiian, Asian, Pacific, or other, is part of the connection among the generations of the family. You can't dissociate those. So how do we get government, private sector, and community buy-in 
on that rent to own model for affordable housing. We'll let Kevin answer that one. Kevin, you got, you've been very active in the legislature. <laughs> I'd like to be able to answer that question, but you know, we are strictly a, a rental developer. Uh, our board of directors has not expanded our operations into home ownership. Uh, and so we focus strictly on rentals. Uh, so I really don't have an answer for that. Well, I, I think the rental approach uh, would be appropriate, especially for Kupuna or the elderly, because with them, you know, that, that's a different, uh, setting and situation. Uh, you know, they typically uh, go after one bedroom or studio. They're trying to, you know, uh, the cost or affordability is a big issue. Uh, we can do a lot more density with the Kupuna house. We're doing one in Moilili, about 105 units. Uh, it's costing us about 32 million, but we're funding it through tax credits and stuff. Uh, but getting back to the uh, rent to own, you know, when you look at the fact that DHHL has over 200,000 acres, lands on all the islands. They have about 100 million in the bank that's just sitting there uh, from the 600 million that uh, was uh, attained a while back, 20 years ago. Uh, they could leverage that uh, to get more tax credits. Uh, I would suggest that the legislature, while they're doing the conversion to bonding of the 250 million for the rental housing revolving fund, that they act in a timely fashion so that we can use that funding for our gap funding that we need. But uh, the process of doing a rent to own, I, I would say is really the answer, not only for DHHL, but for the general public. Because with this COVID situation, a lot of people are not gonna be able to afford or qualify for mortgages. Yeah, you know, Chuck, I, 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 I think it's important to note that the Department of Hawaiian Homelands did in fact uh, put out the bid and award a rent to own concept project that was modeled after the project that I, uh, Kelly and I did in Kapolei. Um, they did that at uh, Laiopua on the Big Island. So I don't think that started construction yet. Um, we, we bid on that project uh, and, it, <laughs> and it went to somebody else. Uh, so, you know, of course I'm, I'm a sore loser, you know, I, I'm a competitive guy, but, the, but they gave it to a good developer. Um, uh, and, and hopefully they'll have success in the Big Island. So, uh, you know, it, it, they are trying it again. Um, I just, you know, I'm a little miffed that it took 17 years for them to, to uh, do something that was clearly a successful uh, demonstration project. So, and, and I want to say that the secret to that, that stuff is, is uh, really in the property management and the homeownership training that goes on in between the time that you put them in as renters to try and turn them into homeowners. Because if you don't do the homeownership education, if you don't do the financial training, and it come, come time to buy the home, it could be a disaster. And we had some families where we led them to water, but they refused to drink, you know, and uh, it was, that was really challenging. So um, it, it's really important to get them to buy in, to do the education, uh, because many times these are generations that that have no idea what it takes to become homeowners, not just the financial responsibilities, but the, the housekeeping, the yard work, the, the maintenance, you know, on, on the, you know, house. Uh, so, so there's a lot that goes into being a homeowner versus a renter. Um, and, and that education piece, that social training is, is a big piece of it. You know, I, I wanted to segue into into something that your original question, Chuck, on on, you know, what is this COVID world going to look like? And I'm, I'm, as a, a advocate of affordable housing, you know, extremely concerned that uh, what I see going to happen is we're going to have a, a really bad recession, maybe a depression. Um, you know, the the city and the city and the state has done a good job in actually adding a lot of affordable housing inventory in, in the recent years. Uh, you know, the converting and enforcing uh, illegal, uh, forcing illegal vacation rentals to enter the long-term rental marketplace, we actually saw market prices being driven down to the, to the point where it became hard to pro forma 
uh, uh, new projects because we're when we look, do the market studies, we're like, hey, we're we're not getting these high rents. You know, they're, the rents are way down there already. Uh, our affordable projects are going to have to compete against the market because the market is that low because of you know 10, 20,000 illegal vacation rentals entering the marketplace. That's a lot of inventory. Well, with this COVID recession that's coming or is here, you know, when, when, the, when the unemployment insurance runs out, these working families aren't gonna be able to afford rent. It's not that there's not gonna be units available, they just won't be able to afford rent, period. They're gonna double up into families like, we, like in past recessions and, and you're going to have this downward slide of rent prices, which means that we as developers can't count on a certain level of revenue uh, from the rentals. And even if it's subsidized, we're going to have to try and subsidize even more, which means that we're going to need more subsidies from the government. But the government's not going to have money. They're, they're, they've spent all their money. They're, you know, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm very concerned that, uh, you know, we're going to be challenged to develop affordable housing under these conditions. Um, you know, I, 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 don't know how we're going to be able to perform on some of these projects to move forward. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Kali and, and uh, Kevin well, have to say. I think part of it is uh, when you look at the, the budgets, especially like for site acquisition, where you have to incorporate the, the cost of the land into it, uh, that, that's a huge hurdle that needs to be addressed, especially with the remaining debt on your project. However, we can eliminate that uh, either through government lands, with, whether it be the city or the state or the DHHL, that's one step that I think at the, the net result will be uh, uh, a less and more affordable rent uh, pricing. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, it's very costly to do these projects. So the, if the uh, government administration can kind of take a look at the, uh, especially the permitting process, which, which, which is a killer, uh, our last project, we almost uh, went under because it took us so long to get our permits approved. Now, if that could be uh, better streamlined, that would be very, very helpful. I, I go back to DHHL, not only do they have a lot of lands available, the entitlement process, fortunately for those trust lands, are obviated because of uh, the it being trust lands and the, uh, I guess, exemption from zoning and the 201H and various other entitlement process. So that adds to the viability of DHHL land. So I think specifically for Hawaii, not only do we address the 28,000 on the waiting list, but the reality is if the state wants to create more economic development, push the DHHL development side. DHHL could be the largest developer in the state, create a lot of jobs, not only for construction workers, architects, engineers, what have you, but more importantly, address the housing shortage. And I think uh, as a practical matter, DHHL to a major extent is the answer. It's a great idea. I think two things I'm, I'm hearing. One is there's a couple of sectors here. There may be homeless or others who may never really qualify or be able to move into home ownership. That's okay. That can be one of the sectors that's dealt with. It has to be because that's significant portion of the population. There's another sector though, that is ready or close to ready to be able to go through a transition period. Then there's that middle sector of people that can grow into it over time. If exactly as you say, a combination of land being made available together with subsidization, subsidization, tax credits, other packages that can incentivize and make development more cost efficient. If you can design and put something like that together and do that on an individual project level, maybe with some DHHL projects, is it possible to build that into a systemic model that can then be expanded beyond DHHL into other communities? Yeah, you know, I, uh, Chuck, I've done the performance and stuff and, and I've advocated. In fact, Kevin was in a meeting with me with uh, Peter Savio. Remember when we were meeting with the mayor and the mayor, uh, Kevin, and, and the mayor was asking for ideas. And I, I've actually done the math and, and the tax credits provide so much equity that if, 
if uh, another government agency wanted to throw in their land or, you know, it, it can be done on a non-Hawaiian homeland scenario, the rent to own model. Um, you know, I've, I've done the math, it can be done. It's not gonna be quite as sweet a deal as Hawaiian homelands, but it's still gonna be, a, 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 there, there's a option to do that. Um, now, Kevin, you guys manage a lot of, uh, and, and own a lot of properties. Are you not worried about your, with this COVID thing and when unemployment insurance runs out for the unemployed, are you not worried about your, your tax credit projects that don't have rent subsidies that the tenants will be able to pay the rent? Well, not what? Us worry? No, we're not worried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we're very worried. Uh, you know, we've been fortunate so far uh, in our entire portfolio. Uh, you know, our receivables have only dropped by about 5%. Uh, when we expected a lot more from this. But again, that's mainly, I think, because of the government, uh, the number one unemployment and then the federal government aid uh, is helping out. But that's, like you said, that's going to run out. Uh, going forward, we're, yes, we're very concerned. Uh, you know, we're exploring all our options uh, at our corporate level as to what we may or may not have to do as far as uh, initiating some form of uh, forbearance. Uh, you know, forgiveness from our mortgage companies, et cetera. Uh, not, uh, not necessarily maybe forgiveness, but a delay uh, uh, on payments because if the tenants don't pay the rent, then we can't pay the mortgage. Uh, we need to keep the water <laughs> going and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the trash getting picked up and things like that. So from an operational perspective, we're very concerned. Going forward, we're also worried on a development perspective because right now there's just a lot of unknowns. Uh, you read in the paper every day about another company uh, going into foreclosure, uh, creating a chapter, uh, chapter seven or whatever. Um, you know, the low-income housing tax credit depends on companies buying tax credits. Exactly. And if they're not doing well, they're not going to buy tax credits. Uh, and it means that the price uh, is going to go down and down and down. And if the price of tax credits goes down, we rely more on local subsidies. Uh, and we've already stretched, I think, local subsidies pretty much to the limit um, as far as our rental housing revolving fund uh, is concerned. Um, so it, it, it puts more pressure on the state and on the counties uh, for, for more subsidies uh, to, to build these units to start with. So we're in, we're in uh, kind of limbo right now, uh, not knowing how things are going to go. Uh, I do expect it to slow down uh, projects that are in the pipeline. Um, and I think the main reason for that is going to be the reduction in, in uh, the price of low-income housing tax credits. Yeah, I mean, we have to remember that back in 2008 in the mortgage lending crisis, tax, the pricing of tax credits went from like 98 cents uh, on the dollar down to, it was below 80 cents, I, I recall, and uh, which, which is a huge drop. I mean, it basically makes projects unfeasible so that they had to pass that para, right? The, and which, which actually created a, a floor um, at like 86 cents or something. Uh, but yeah, projects just weren't feasible back then under, under that kind of tax credit pricing, as Kevin mentioned. And I think, uh, you know, with respect to the subsidies, uh, the legislature right now is looking to fund the, the DERF along with the uh, Rental Housing Revolving Fund. And, you know, that, that fills those gaps, uh, especially if the pricing for the tax credits go down. So it's, it's very important that the, our legislature recognize that, you know, while it may take a while to use those funding set aside because these projects takes three to four years to actually develop and then use the fund, it's not funds that are just being wasted. They are critical and the legislature needs to understand that they, if, if anything, maybe put more funds into that because it's gonna be very, very challenging for developers yeah, like us. Kelly, where are they going to get the money from? Well, they're not the federal government. They cannot print money. And they cannot raise taxes because there's less businesses operating profitably. I mean, so where where does the state government get that money from? 
Well, exactly where they're getting it now is to look at some of those funds that are just sitting there that need to be swept into uh, different other accounts. Uh, granted that uh, the revenue is not going to be there. So you're, you're correct. But at the same uh, time, I defense? think they have to pri prioritize whatever money they do have. Honey is important for, for housing, affordable housing. And as we come into our last couple of minutes here, we know two things are going to happen. One, COVID economic impact is going to continue long after COVID. DBED's projected six years to return to status on tourism. We also know that there are going to more, be more future disasters, disruptions. Preparedness is the key. What is most needed for affordable housing to be sustainable in preparedness for it? Last minute or two. Well, that's a, that's a tough question because, uh, you know, affordable housing projects don't put out a lot of cash. Uh, to begin with. Uh, and so uh, from a financial perspective, you know, how do we save more uh, to prepare for the unknown impacts down the road? Very, very difficult to do uh, and maintain current operations. You know, through, through this whole COVID, you know, we have been essential businesses through this whole pandemic. And our staff, uh, particularly our, our operating staff, our property management staff, uh, they've been working every day at the properties, keeping those properties operational. Um, and uh, it's just hard. And not only that, our costs have gone up because of all the precautions we need to take as a result of COVID. Uh, so how do we prepare? I guess, you know, we're, we're, we are uh, absorbing right now lessons learned uh, during this process and, and trying to document that. Uh, and going forward, it's, uh, it's even affecting the way uh, that we're looking at design, uh, particularly in our senior properties, uh, to try to uh, enact social distance, distancing, which is completely opposite to our whole mindset uh, in any type of affordable housing project. We want interaction. Uh, particularly I apologize, Kevin, but hey, we're out of time. Any final concluding sentence, Craig, Kali? No, Kevin said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Kali? My, final, my final statement would be that, uh, you know, with respect to this uh, pandemic situation, one of the answers is to support affordable housing development because it does create jobs. It does create uh, an economy that uh, is generating, I guess, money for a, a lot of different people, but more importantly, housing. Thank you all. I think we understand affordable housing is essential. Its priority and its support need to be bumped way up from where it has been. Thank all of you. Thank Much you. Hello. Thank you, Thank you Jeff.